Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Astrometric Channel on this Sunday night. And I think tonight I better say hi to a lot of people that maybe aren't usually here. You are groupies. You have come to listen to Trevor, and Trevor has led you here, and you are certainly welcome. I want to tell you something about the Astroimaging Channel, in case you don't know. The Astroimaging Channel is different from most of the YouTube channels you see out there. Most of them are produced, and if somebody goofs, they stop the production and redo it. And if you have a question, well, you can put it in the comments, but you can't ask it live. Well, we're a little bit different here, and I'll show you one of the ways we're a little bit different by sharing my screen and going over to the YouTube. And oh, I got to turn my voice off. And you can see that there is a whole bunch of people over here, and they're going to be asking questions. Uh, go ahead and just ask your question, whatever it is that you have. And when there's a good time to interrupt Trevor, We'll go ahead and ask it for you, and you can get your questions answered right here and now. Um, there's also a place down around here someplace to uh, subscribe and even contribute, but not, that's not a big deal. But uh, we're a little different than everybody else in that you can ask these questions, and uh, you'll get your answers from the man himself, the star, the icon. Anyway, um, but we have another star in the making. There's a, uh, uh, go, let's go over to the calendar here because there's there's been a calendar disruption, an interruption in space time here where Trevor's here today, just like he's supposed to. And Gary M is here. Gary M was supposed to be down someplace in December where Jan Talbot is now because John had, was inconvenienced by having to pick up a new RV or something like that. So uh, John and Gary switched places. So Gary's gonna be next week. Gary, would you, uh, I'm gonna stop. Uh, share it so we can see you. And can you tell us um, um, uh, a little bit about what you're going to be talking about next week? Sure. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Molly, do I need to share anything or can I just talk here? You can you just talk. talk. Okay. So uh, last year, um, I was uh, Alex and Tim asked me to come on and talk about uh, my work on the ARP catalog. And uh, I enjoyed that. And I'm really thankful to be asked again back this year. I've uh, published something called the M Deep Sky Compendium, and uh, basically the R presentation was was part of the generator for that. Um, I had through my Astrobin work uh, put together a number of different catalogs and compendiums and uh, collections actually, and people kept asking me uh, for the links to the different posters and so on, and were prompting me to try to put all of this into a single. Uh, document and so that's what I did. Uh, put it into a, actually it's it's a series of two documents. One's a PDF, 460 page free, uh, downloadable PDF that has uh, 2,000 of my imaged targets in it, in the form of catalogs. I talk about 28 different catalogs and 90 different collections. So a catalog is what you'd be familiar with, like the ARP catalog, the ABLE uh, PN and Galaxy catalogs. Um, you know, the typical ones, uh, Messier and Caldwell and so on. So there's 28 of those, not all in, in, in completion, obviously. Some of them are thousands of objects, so I don't, I don't have that. Uh, but I also have a number of collections. So the collections are not catalogs, but they're uh, characteristics. So they might be super thin galaxies, might be uh, certain types of PN, certain types of streams. So I put all of this in the 460-page document. And the whole purpose of that document is to help astrophotographers find targets uh, to image, because I was hearing that over and over that after you get through the normal targets, it's just hard to find anything special. So that's half of the show there, and that's the compendium regarding the PDF. The other half will be about um, the spreadsheet. So I put together a spreadsheet that is a planning sheet, because once you have these targets, once you know what you want to see, you want to know where to find that target. So in the spreadsheet, you put in your location, uh, time of year, all the objects are, are there. Uh, all the objects have mouse over images. Uh, it'll tell you if it's up that night or not, how close it is to the moon. It'll give you color guidance to know whether those targets are something that you should go after. And so the two kind of work hand in hand. One helps you uh, find objects or, or presents objects for you that you might want to image. The other one, once you have a, a list of objects, uh, you can go to the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet's about half a, half a million cells. And um, you can look at the objects there, and you can also find out where they are on that night. It's all free. And uh, it's something that I hope uh, I was just 
I'm hopeful it can be useful to all the people out there that enjoy asset photography. So Alex, that's all I'll say now and look forward to talking to everybody next week. Okay. Um, and one thing I should tell you um, is that if you want a sneak peek at um, Gary's um, project, uh, go to Cloudy Nights in the beginners area and uh, type in uh, search for compendium and that will get you the links to the um, to the to the work and you can download all 420 pages of the book so it's there it's there already go go do your homework and get ready for that show okay um, and let's see I think that um, you know I'm always looking for presenters we're always looking for presenters the hardest part of this job we have to do it every week we have to bring you somebody quality every week we need people like you to not only watch the show on a regular basis but we'd love to have you present on the show if you can figure out how to do astro imaging you should be able to figure out how to share some of your expertise with other people so please hit the contact button uh, on our website and uh, volunteer to, to um, be part of the program. Now, enough about us. Let's get back. What's this Trevor guy? Trevor Jones. Trevor Jones. Are you becoming a backyard uh, astronomer? Can you tell us how that works? Go ahead and take I, over, dude. I certainly can, Alex. Thank you for that introduction. I'm going to share my screen and want to make sure that everyone can see this okay and that you can hear me all right are we good yeah looks good perfect okay so first of all thank you all so much for having me on the astro imaging channel i remember watching this channel back in the day thinking i am definitely not smart enough to enter this hobby uh, you people are wizards in my eyes what what you have accomplished uh, you know your stuff, and I still feel the imposter synd syndrome kick in uh, when speaking to groups like this. So uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm much more nervous for this talk than any of the videos I create, because uh, as you know, live is a whole different animal than when you can uh, edit and cut out the bad parts and everything. So I'm out of my element here, but I'll hopefully make it work. So. Um, if you're here to learn how to make uh, advanced air masks and uh, blend the core of Andromeda in Photoshop, uh, I apologize because this talk is gonna be probably quite a bit different than most of the other talks on this channel. Not very technical, more of kind of a life story and how astrophotography was a big part of that. So regardless, I hope you enjoy it uh, and that some of you have some great questions along the way and i love questions that's that's the best part for me so hopefully there'll be some good ones so this was a talk i originally gave at the aic the advanced imaging conference this spring and since technically this is also aic i figured it would work here too um, but i think that the best way for me to offer value to this crowd because i know there's a lot of expert imagers in this group uh, whose knowledge is a lot more extensive in the world of astronomy than mine is, uh, you know, I, I'm technically a professional astrophotographer now, but the truth is I still don't really know what I'm doing. And if you don't believe me, there are entire threads <laughs> about how dumb I am on cloudy nights. If you wanna look into it, there's proof. So that's the trade-off of being able to make a living sharing your life and experiences online with the world. Anyone can watch, judge, and criticize. But before we go too deep into what's really what it's really like being an astrophotography YouTuber, let's start from the beginning. So for those that don't know me, my name is Trevor Jones, and I run an astrophotography YouTube channel and website that focuses on helping beginners get into the hobby. So I'm a YouTuber first and astrophotographer second. And I say that to make sure that you understand that my main goal is to share knowledge of astrophotography through video unlike a traditional professional astrophotographer it's not really about the pictures that i take they're important for sure but it's not my primary goal a lot of people don't get that when i meet new people and tell them what i do uh, you know i take pictures of space sounds really cool but there's a lot more to it than that so before i share the wild ride a bit on leading up to this talk i wanted to provide some insight 
into the slightly awkward, painfully average fellow you see in the picture right there. I may be the main character of this story, but it really isn't about me. It's about astrophotography in the incredible impact it has on others. This talk will include everything from the evolution of my personal deep sky imaging experiences from amateur to pro in quotation marks, which still doesn't feel right, to the eye-opening moments of YouTube growth and the truth about what it's like to have a large social media following. Before the job title YouTuber taught my resume, uh, my previous job titles were pizza man, graphic designer, creative director, and eventually a content marketer for a software company. A lot of these learned professional skills would apply to my future business, uh, except for the pizza making, I think. I, I patiently worked my way up to the, the corporate ladder over the course of a decade because I thought that's just what you do. You know, I grew up in a lower middle class family. My dad was a custodian when I was young. Um, not a lot of money. Higher education wasn't on my radar after high school, and I'm still very self-conscious about the fact that I interact with so many highly educated people in a science-based career now. So I met um, my wife, Ashley, uh, when I was 17 years old. Uh, I married her 16 years later, and there we are in the high school hallway in 2002. Um, when we were in our early 20s, she used to say, um, don't ask me to marry you because I'll say no. That was really nice. Eh? Well, we know who won that argument, so take that, Ash. She's a big part of this story, too, and why she is with that telescope there now. She actually works for Astro Backyard. So I was a drummer in a funk hip-hop band for about six years. Uh, this seems to be an obscure note in an astrophotography talk, but you'll see where this musical background fits into the story a little later. Um, just a little pause here. Can you guys actually see a little window uh, with, with me talking, or is it just the slides you're seeing? I've got yeah. a picture of, of you uh, talking over top. Okay, and it, so it is just me then. Um, okay, good. Normally, I'll, I like to see a few faces in the chat sometimes, but I'll assume the best and that people are smiling and nodding along. Yeah, we've all turned off our cameras, so go on. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. So no matter what stage of life you're in, if you're you know, a drummer in a funk band like I am there, the, the gangly fellow in the black jacket, or, you know, or way, you know, in a, with a science-based background, very highly educated, I hope that this story inspires you to take a chance on something that you're, you're passionate about. And for this crowd, uh, I have a feeling I know what that is. Because you know what? It might just work out. Um, creating one of the largest channels on a little backwards here, uh, one of the largest astrophotography channels on YouTube for now, um, a full-time job for my wife and I was born out of experimentation and an acceptance of the fact that it probably won't work, but I could try, right? You never know. Before the dream of sharing my favorite hobby with others existed, my astrophotography ende endeavors were limited to brief opportunities to set up gear at my parents' house, my future in-laws, or at my local astronomy club. That's this uh, this here. This you can see my my little scope set up in my parents' backyard. There, my first real telescope and and camera. I followed the standard familiar path of the amateur astrophotographer. Of the, hey, what if I took a picture through my dog? And that turned into okay, what exactly is an equatorial mount? And which eventually became it. Uh, how much is this all going to cost me? So I purchased nearly all of my equipment secondhand. Um, Astromart was, was a website I visited frequently to look for new deals. And my first successful deep sky rig consisted of a Celestron CG5, an Explore Scientific ED80, and a modified Canon 450D. And this was uh, back in 2012 for reference. So this was the rig behind my first images of Orion, the Dumbbell, Veil, Andromeda, all this, this DSLR and compact refractor combo had a massive impact on my progress. There you can see uh, my old school DSLR rig set up that time in a friend's backyard. Um, and just to capture a photo of the pillars of creation uh, just blew me away. And, and needless to say, I was absolutely hooked. 
it allowed me to break through into that rare secret club known as deep sky astrophotographers. So one of the main reasons I, I quit the band that I was in, which was you know my, my other side hobby at the time, was that it conflicted with my astro imaging time. So it, it ended up being very positive change in my lifestyle as well to switch from you know playing in the bars at night to something a little more um, you know better for my lifestyle, which was observing space and taking pictures. There are about five or six guys in my astronomy club uh, who were as nuts about imaging as I was. And we would spend every clear night we could at our club's dark sky site. I was the youngest one there by a landslide. And I think they really enjoyed showing me the ropes and hanging out. And looking back, I owe a lot of my success now to their willingness to help me. I love the entire astrophotography experience from packing my gear in the car to showing my coworkers the shot I took the following night. Um, what did you do last weekend? Oh, I took a picture of the Eagle Nebula. What'd you do? I just, I just loved that that was my life now. I used Photoshop extensively at work, so I had a head start on the image processing side of things. Uh, and I'm, but I'm convinced that my, my existing Photoshop bad habits might have actually hindered my processing skills early on, but at least I didn't need to learn an entirely new editing software from scratch. Uh, as many people do that enter the hobby. So although traveling to set up my gear was a fun adventure, uh, especially with the hardcore group of guys at my astronomy club, uh, I always knew that a dedicated space would allow my hobby to expand. So in the summer of 2015, Ashley and I would purchase our first home and move out of our humble apartment with no balcony. Uh, astrophotography had been a part of my life on and off for about five years at this point, uh, but the idea of having an actual backyard to set up my telescope in for the first time was a dream come true. After all, this is what I've been banging my head against the cubicle wall for all these years, right? A whopping 950 square feet in one of the most light polluted, sketchiest parts of town. <laughs> but you know what? We loved it because it was ours. I had a nice big garage to store my growing collection of telescopes and mounts, and it would eventually become the set for my YouTube channel. Oh, and one other pivotal change happened then. We adopted Rudy, our black lab hound mix from the local animal shelter uh, the day after we moved in. So at 31 years old, a, a, a fiance, a backyard, and a dog were now a part of my life, and I felt like I had it all. I know this is supposed to be a talk about astrophotography and I've got pictures of my dog on the screen, but Rudy is an integral part of this story and I can't imagine it without him. Rudolph, his full name was found in a dumpster in Louisiana just before Christmas uh, with eight other puppies and the rescue team named them after Santa's reindeer. So Dasher, Dancer, you get the idea. Uh, this was the day we picked him up. This is straight from the shelter. Uh, and you can see the the hope in his eyes for a better life. Um, our our good boy Rudy there. He if he only knew what he was in for. This rescue dog from Louisiana has spent his entire life, uh, his entire adopted life, surrounded by telescopes, extension cords, and spending late nights under the stars. From being thrown away to being adored by thousands of people. He deserves every second of it. I'm convinced that he understands that when it's clear, it means that we'll be outside all night. It's, it's all he knows. He has never, not once, kicked a tripod leg, tripped over a power cord, or bumped into me while imaging. He was built for this. <laughs> you can see him there in his construction outfit uh, as I was about to pour concrete for the pier for the Black Dog Observatory, which you can um, understand why I named it that now. So after we moved in, I thought it would be fun to share the excitement of my new backyard sessions online through a simple blog and document my experiences, a place to archive all of the pictures I was taking and record the details. Even though there were many fantastic astrophotography websites online at the time, I, I knew that I could offer something a little different, something visual, and something fun. My graphic design skills came in handy and I tried to use those skills to my advantage whenever I could. Um, I handled a lot of SEO and content creation 
at my current job, I would apply absolutely everything I knew in this arena to my personal project. I focused on beginner level equipment and uh, lots of visual references. I would cater to the crowd that didn't want to get into a debate on cloudy nights, the ones that simply wanted to watch what I do and replicate the results on their own. This is how I learn new things. Uh, I just watch a YouTube video. Um, and just a side note here about the Astro Imaging channel, um, the amount of incredible information available on the Astro Imaging channel alone is mind blowing. Uh, kudos for what you guys do. I, I can't believe the amount of free in, incredible content from all these talented speakers that you have. So I just wanted to give you guys a pat on the back for that. I always tried to make it clear that I wasn't the best. Um, I was just someone or, or that I was doing it the correct way for astrophotography. It was just what's working for me. It was still just a blog at this point and I had no videos. Uh, and you could almost hear the crowds, the, the sounds of crickets when I when the site loaded. There we go. Um, I was writing image processing tutorials and step-by-step -step guides for how to auto guide to a ghost town. Uh, it was nearly a year in, but there was little to no traffic on the website. And I questioned whether it was worth all of the late nights and the weekends of, of work. I knew that if I wanted my little corner of the internet to succeed, I would have to create a memorable brand and that I would need to have a consistent, thriving social media presence. This was the, the first blog that I created, the first variation of Astro Backyard. Uh, Photos from Earth, I thought was a cool name. And it was on uh, the free platform called Blogspot, if anyone remembers that. Um, I really didn't know, um, you know how to create a sophisticated website at this point. Uh, despite my marketing knowledge, I did more of the um, written content and, and stuff like that, as opposed to the, the coding or anything like that. But it eventually became Astro Back, Backyard as the blog. So the first thing I did was sign up for Twitter uh, with the handle Astro Backyard. It had a nice ring to it. Uh, it's, after all, it was astronomy in the backyard, right? It doesn't get clearer than that. So maybe I should register the domain name too, astrobackyard.com. Okay, it's available, nice, perfect. There it is on Instagram and YouTube too. Okay, Astro Backyard, I guess that's my thing. And unlike the website, the, the astro photography community on social was, was very active and it was growing. I could post a question on my Facebook page and receive 50 answers within the first 20 minutes. I was starting to realize that just how passionate the astrophotography community was. And I love the fact that I could hit it off with someone I've never met in another country because we shared a common obsession. This community at the time, this is back in about 2015, it was a fraction of the size it is now, but I had a feeling it was about to get a lot bigger. Um, so the, the blog, as I said, Photos from Earth um, on the free blogging platform uh, that integrated with Google Plus, if that dates me, um, documented my progress from my very first photo of the moon back in 2010, all the way up to my current photos. I was getting more into deep sky astrophotography. Uh, but I realized if I wanted people to actually come to my website, that I couldn't just show them all the great photos I was taking. Um, you know, I realized, okay, what's in it for them? How can I help them do it? That's what people search for. So I paid a developer to set up my site on WordPress, something a little more sustainable and scalable for the long term. And uh, it could handle the growth of the future traffic. And it was a bit of an investment at the time. Uh, he helped me monetize the site through Google AdSense, which was a big deal for me to the thought of making any sort of income on this little side hustle I was working on. Uh, but that was exciting to me. So I was all in on the idea at this point. Uh, because if it didn't work out, I was at the two grand that I really couldn't afford to get the, the website set up. So I was motivated to make it work. But it was a big moment because I had a professional website, a new potential source of income, and all I had to do was share my most passionate hobby with the world. Perfect, right? So suddenly I had a reason to expand my knowledge and push, which was once a, a casual hobby into the next phase, something that could help support the hobby teach others and scratch that entrepreneurial itch that I had to build something. It was around this time when I thought to myself, 
okay, imagine being able to do astrophotography, this nerdy, obscure obsession for a living. How would I go about that? Even if I could, would, it, would I begin to resent this hobby, my escape from stress and work, if it became a job? At this time, I had a comfortable nine to five job as a creative director for a small business network. It was safe, it was familiar, and I was deep into my comfort zone. I had no plans of leaving. I was grateful to have this job, but I certainly, it didn't excite me the way that working on Astro Backyard did. I suddenly became irritated at the fact that I was contributing my best creative ideas and ener energy into someone else's dream, my boss's. The Astro Backyard as a career idea grew larger and larger until it was all I could think about. And it wasn't about money, it was about freedom. Not the take two weeks off whenever I want kind of freedom, the freedom to put 100% of my creative energy into something that excited me and allows me to actually help people and navigate this crazy hobby. I would work on Astro Backyard every second of free time I had. I would stay up until 4 a.m. on a weeknight, photograph a nebula in the backyard, and write a tutorial about how I did it that same night. I couldn't get home from work fast enough to continue where I left off. I would dedicate entire weekends to building out new sections of the website. Uh, spending time doing anything else just seemed like a distraction. Um, even though was, nothing was really happening yet, I liked the idea of doing this all the time. And at this point, I also realized that my attempt to turn my hobby into a career didn't take away from my enjoyment of astrophotography, it grew tenfold. Every picture became that much more meaningful because it had purpose. People were relying on my knowledge and inspiration now. I would later discover that this passion, that this work energy is relentless and why entrepreneurs will go to the ends of the earth to see their idea through and their business survive. I had no idea I could work so hard at anything. The website was growing. I was earning a cool $12 a month by running small ads on the site, and I did it. I'm getting paid to write about astrophotography. Huge victory. A little tip for anyone uh, that has a hard time convincing friends and family to let you out for a night of astrophotography, turn it into an instructional blog, because then you can say, ah, sorry, I'm working that night. That's a, that works better. So soon after moving into our first house and journaling my experiences on astrobackyard.com, I decided it would be to step out of my comfort zone and attempt to film astrophotography specific videos in hopes of directing people to the blog. I had no experience being on camera, filming, editing videos, uh, and it showed. My first 25 videos were awful. I can't watch them. Uh, just digging through the archives for this presentation was a humbling experience. Uh, come on, Trev, you couldn't even look at the camera. Poor video, sound quality, sloppy editing, and most of all, a clueless host with no idea of how to effectively talk to the cam camera and articulate ideas. When people critique my on-camera skills now, I just think, you should have seen me before. I used a Canon 70D DSLR to film the videos, no mics, no lighting, just hit the big red button and start rambling. In general, I knew what I was talking about and it felt helpful, but I would make the viewer sit through awkward pauses and across the room audio. I think my first 100 YouTube subscribers watched out of pure amusement or maybe it was pity, but either way, I couldn't believe anyone was watching. Uh, if so if any of my super early subs are here in the chat, please let me know because I want to thank you at the end of the presentation. So I continued to film and publish videos about my adventures in the backyard. I tried to offer a mix of informative image processing techniques, equipment recommendations, and vlog style. Let's photograph the Orion Nebula style videos. I stuck to what I had the most experience with which was wide field refractors, DSLR cameras, light pollution filters, and processing with Adobe Photoshop. Even though I clearly wasn't an expert, I knew how to take and edit a decent astro photo, and that was enough for others to listen to what I had to say. I had very modest expectations for these videos back then in terms of views and engagement. 
it almost took the pressure off knowing that not many people would see them. Uh, it was really nice to have an end goal for a night of imaging too. It, it wasn't just about the satisfaction of completing an image anymore. It was sharing the entire experience through video. In terms of production, I learned at least one new trick each time I published a video, whether it was a smoother editing transition or better lighting while filming. Uh, it was a very gradual improvement of quality over the first year. So I knew my technical skills in astrophotography would improve, but my confidence and presentation skills did too, simply by going through the motions over and over again. There's something quite painful about editing a long video of yourself. I couldn't stand watching myself stumble through sentences multiple times, uh, but you quickly learn your quirks and how to correct them with the motivation of not having to play them back in the next edit. Side note for the trolls and haters that say mean things about me in the comments, no one hates my stupid face more than me. I've spent more time looking at my own face on video than any man ever should. But Astro Backyard wasn't about me, it was about inspiring others to take action. And when I reminded myself of this, everything became easier. I'm the guide, I'm the instructor, I'm not the star. So nobody else cares or notices the things that I'm self-conscious about. The quality of the pictures I take in the video comes second to the value of the inspiration and instruction I provide, always. A word of advice here, if you're at this stage yourself and you, you wanna get into this, please ignore the little voice in your head that's telling you, no one cares what you have to say, you're not cut out for this, you should just give up, just post it anyway. Because the voice in my head was loud and choosing to ignore it my, my personal hangups for the sake of others is the only reason I'm talking to you guys right now. So at this time, the experts in astrophotography field didn't notice me or didn't care. And I was truly fine with that. I didn't model my journey after anyone else in the astronomy realm. And I believe this helped set my channel apart from the rest and develop my own style. Ah, uh, the music. I, I decided I'm not going to play. That's not worth it. Um, but you'll get the point here. So love it or hate it, it's a big part of my channel. The music is. Um, and I've seen enough new Astro YouTubers out there to know that it's not just me that like it. So I've always been a gamer. And some of the video game soundtracks I listened to just went so well with an Astro video. I would get chills in the editing process because these soundtracks seem to magically align with the story I was telling. Skyrim, Mass Effect, and many more had incredible scores that seemed like they were written for astrophotography. I think this might have been one of the magic touches that propelled the channel forward early on uh, it, because it was so different. It was by far the most enjoyable part of the production process for me. Um, Oh, it's going to autoplay. Um, so all the, all the music I used in these early videos was video game music because you could use it royalty free. It wouldn't get flagged and shut down uh, because at the time you could use these video game scores. So it worked out really well for me because, you know, that was some of my favorite music anyway, and I could add it to my videos. It was, it was a lot of fun, but I, I really think it, it, went a long way in telling the story and capturing the mood and emotions felt that night in an astro imaging, at least to me, it helped tell my story. Sometimes I would actually find the song first and then film a segment segment to match the pace and the feel of it. Um, so I, I, the, the videos that uh, are here, it was from the Uncharted soundtrack, if anyone's ever played that game, but uh, I won't play it. But I really leaned into the style and I thought that even if some people think it's over the top, um, I think it's really cool. So I remember seeing comments like, why do you have to ruin the video with all the music? And I would just think, you're gonna hate this channel. So I, I believe that I want those to autoplay. I believe that it helps tell the story um, and capture the, the emotions felt that night, as I said. Um, and again, the, the random skills from my former life as a drummer, um, as a musician, the, the timing, the pacing, the crescendos, 
were all being applied to this new adventure. It almost felt like everything was meant to be. In the early stages of Astro Backyard, when videos were starting to get traction, I never once thought of things like, uh, I hope everyone thinks I'm knowledgeable and people consider me to be an expert and an authority on this topic. In my head, it just wasn't even a consideration. I focused a lot on trying to capture the feeling and, and what it was actually like to be an astrophotographer and that crazy lifestyle of, of spending nights in the backyard. I found my editing style and realized that there was always a beautiful underlying story to tell. So I injected small pieces of my personal life into the videos. And I think that helped others understand what it was like to make astrophotography a part of your day-to-day uh, -day life, because it, it is such a wild hobby to, to actually tell someone that's not used to it uh, what's involved is, is quite a shock to most people. So sharing the things that were happening in my life with the audience became kind of therapeutic to me, talking to that camera. The support was overwhelming. It was, it was all good at that point. People, a lot of people rooting for me um, because it's hard to experience moments of joy or sadness in your life without showing it on camera. You know, it's one thing when you're, you're writing on a blog, they don't see that, but they can see it in your face if you're going through something and something's not right. So I found it easier to just explain what was going on and uh, the audience was usually very supportive. It was really nice. By 2018, I was spending a lot more time planning, scripting, and editing new videos than ever before. Uh, the channel was growing at an astonishing rate and the audience seemed to be really interested in what I had to say. It was exhilarating to actually have an audience after three years of work and I wasn't about to take it for granted. You'd think this was a lot of pressure uh, and it is now, uh, but in the first two, three years, I was running off pure adrenaline. I thought to myself, what I lack in expertise and technical knowledge, I can make up for in reliability and honesty. Astrophotography can be a daunting hobby in the beginning, and I adored being in a position to ease that process for so many people. Explosive growth has a way of fueling your confidence, and it moves so fast you don't have, a time, you don't have time to second guess it. That would come a little later. 2018 was the year that I finally decided it was time to go full time with Astro Backyard, but I had to come up with a plan before quitting my job. I still wasn't earning enough through the website and YouTube ads to offset my salary, but I could see that day coming. Ashley had a very stable job, which eased the pressure of this somewhat impulsive, naive plan to go all in as a YouTuber. Um, but she supported the decision 100%. I still remember racing home from work after a particularly soul crushing morning at the office to meet with her on our 30 minute lunch break to talk about it. We hadn't even celebrated our one year anniversary yet, our one year wedding anniversary. And this woman stood by her pizza man and his impractical dreams. And now that's love. So uh, this, this is how it went with Ashley on the phone with my mother-in-law that night. Hey mom, not much. Uh, oh, Trevor's quitting his job to become a YouTuber. Yep, I'm serious. Yep, it's a real thing. So 2019 was my first year as a full-time YouTuber and I went absolutely nuts. Now I now had the time to dedicate 100% of my energy into this growing business. I took everything a little more seriously because failure was not an option, not one that I could accept anyway. I did my best to produce more videos than ever before without a dip in quality. And I've always thought that asking for someone's attention for 10 minutes is asking a lot or an hour for that matter. And you better deliver the goods when you do. As the YouTube channel gained in popularity, my personal knowledge and experience in astrophotography grew. I lived and breathed astrophotography day and night and found that by explaining every step of my process to the camera, I understood my own equipment and methods on a deeper level than ever before. I had to expand my knowledge and push, which was once a casual hobby to the next level and teaching astrophotography was now my job. The story doesn't end with a DSLR and 80 millimeter refractor. Although balancing my empathy for those on a tight budget became more difficult, I knew I couldn't make video after video using the same equipment. 
So I forced myself to experiment with, with new telescope types, cameras, and foreign software. To say that this went against my natural grain is an understatement. If it wasn't for the YouTube channel, I'd probably be, still be shooting with that old 80 millimeter refractor on an HEQ5. The reality is of, you know, of being, staying current means that you need to adopt new tools, both hardware and software, and share the results. And I always find it funny when the trolls get angry about seeing me new, use new gear. And I'm thinking, I'm doing this for you. As you can imagine, certain upgrades are much easier to implement onto the channel than others. Testing a new color camera or filter is generally pretty painless and fun, but weaning yourself off Photoshop, an application I've been using for 20 years to switch to PixInsight is not. Because exploring a new tool is one thing, but teaching it to others is entirely different. A typical video on my channel, I'm a little behind here. A typical video on my channel will involve five to 10 hours of actual deep sky imaging, 10 hours of processing, and up to 40 hours of filming and editing. Yes, that may sound absurd, but it's absolutely true. You should see the amount of content that never gets published. I meticulously craft my videos to be as informative, entertaining, and fun to watch as possible. And I obsess over it to an unhealthy degree. Um, but of course, no one will ever see a single second of this masterpiece in, if they don't click on the video and watch it. Enter the most bizarre, unforgiving, uncomfortable part of being a YouTuber, in my opinion, titles and thumbnails. The key concept I think a lot of newcomers aren't getting right is that the visuals in the thumbnail need to make it extremely clear about what the viewer is going to get in the video because most viewers are scrolling by incredibly fast on their phones and you want, and you want something you've worked on so hard, something you've worked so hard on to at least be seen, right? So creating a thumbnail that represents the complicated processes involved with astrophotography can be challenging and crafting a title that fits the bill can be too. There also needs to be a hint of intrigue or suspense so that the viewer has to watch and find out what happens. It's a mysterious experience. Sometimes you get it right, most of the times you don't. A large number of people will see the thumbnail, picture, and title and make a snap judgment call about the entire 12 minute video uh, of me and me as a person and my video. They'll see, they'll see the thumbnail and say, oh, that guy, screw him. The actual comment I've had. Um, an instant thumbs down, hateful comment, and a rant on cloudy nights. Again, nothing against cloudy nights. That's where they like to gang up on me, though, uh, about how much they can't stand me without even watching the video. How do you think that feels, the, the, the hatred without watching a single second of video? I call this the I hate your face crowd. The worst part isn't that they are missing out on my absolute best content based on what they assume the, they, they assume the video is about. It's that some of them spread misinformation about me to others for attention. Uh, it's kind of a crushing feeling to read a lie about yourself online. It hurts, but to see others believing this angry individual without questioning their motives is another. That's, that's another story. It's even worse. So I refuse to take, take the bait and retaliate either uh, because if i let them win we all lose at least the ones that i inspire and that is the group of people that is just too important to me to to lose them on some things just because of my own hang-ups on on how i feel about what people are saying about me so unfortunately it seems to be the reality of being a public figure online yes even in our sub niche of astrophotography if I told you it rolls off my back, I would be lying to you. So social media, including YouTube, can be cruel to the amateur astrophotographer. I wish that the best photos rose to the top of the algorithm and that pure talent and hard work were recognized. But unfortunately, we live in a digital world where engagement, clicks, and reactions, good or bad, dominate the social media algorithms. This isn't such a bad formula unless you're starting out and fighting tooth and nail to get traction. So many of the most talented astrophotographers I've ever seen go largely unnoticed, while images and videos with uninspired, recycled, growth hacking tactics are shown to the world. 
as a marketer by blood, I'm conflicted when I see this because I understand and enjoy the, the challenge of getting my message out, but I also refuse for this to come at the expense of my vision. Don't dilute your impact and value of your content to your audience to gain vanity metrics. How big of a number do you need to see before you're satisfied? I'm guilty of this myself, where I start comparing myself to others and saying, well, wow, they have a much bigger following than I do. No good comes from that, and it really doesn't matter at all. These are murky waters with no clear passage through, and I think you'll find that both sides can go too far. Whether it's shaming someone for being a little too clickbaity, guilty, or naively expecting your content to be discovered just because it's good. I think that I'm playing a game right now the right way and that I use my exposure to nurture and grow the astrophotography community rather than to spread toxic behavior and negativity. There will always be a new wave of excited new astrophotographers entering our world via my YouTube channel. I'm thrilled and honored to be a part of that experience. Hopefully when they've outgrown my skill level, they'll continue to watch, but I understand if they move on. I don't like the idea of being unrelatable to my target audience, and I have to constantly keep myself in check in this regard. Uh, beginners need my help most, and this is where I'll continue to concentrate my energy. Um, that is one of my first photos of the Orion Nebula on the left there, and when I finally got my first APOD, which was a big deal to me, and, and I know many of you it still is as well, um, just to show, you know, for my own journey as an astrophotographer, that was a big moment. So if you're creating quality content and not getting the type of engagement and exposure you hoped, think about who you wanna reach and why they're watching. On YouTube, making videos people want to watch makes that the overarching theme must relate back to the person watching. It's about them, not you. Even though it appears as though my channel is about my progress in astrophotography, it's actually about how my viewers can learn from my mistakes and replicate my successes. As nice as it would be to think that half a million strangers care about what I'm up to next, it's more about how I've inspired them in the past and what I can teach them in the future. My goal was never to be seen as the best astrophotographer of all time. It was to inspire as many newcomers to the hobby as possible. So the fact that I was invited to speak here on the Astro Imaging channel today not only validates that I've met this goal, but that it was worth chasing. Other than convincing Ashley to marry me, sharing my astrophotography journey with others on YouTube is the most amazing thing I've done with my life. I've once heard that success is measured by the number of people you've helped and that if that's the case, I'm very proud and honored to say that I feel very successful in my mission thus far. It makes all the sacrifice and the discomfort and uncertainty worth it. And it gives my life a unique feeling of purpose that not everyone gets to experience. Thank you all so much for, for listening to this talk. I know it's a bit all over the place and that it was very different from the talks that you normally hear here on the Astro Imaging channel. But because you know this is a YouTube channel and a lot of you, uh, I think, love sharing your images and want to inspire others, hopefully this was an inspiring story to you to get started. So hopefully that was useful to you. And, and thanks again for, for listening. So um, we're looks like we're done a little bit early, which means we have lots of time for questions, right? That's a good thing, because I think a lot of your people came here for the live show to ask you questions <laughs> about all kinds of things. You know, I, 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 I have a, I'm sorry, we have a couple of questions, but the, they aren't as uh, grand and sweeping as your story. Oh, so they're, they're kind of kind of a step back. More Let specific. Me just, yeah, they're very specific. Uh, there was a question about what kind of video editing software you use, and do you still use the same uh, one now as you did when you started? Yeah, so I use uh, Adobe Premiere, which is part of the Adobe Creative Suite. Uh, and the reason for that was that uh, I used a lot of those Adobe tools already, um, uh, Photoshop, Lightroom, and all that stuff. So it made sense to spend the time, time investment, the huge time investment to learn that video editing software. 
And because once you pick one, you really want to stick with it because uh, I'm still learning new things about that software every day. Um, so there's other great tools available. Uh, so if you haven't you know, chosen one yet, it's wide open, but when you do pick one, uh, stick to it. And, I, and I've chosen Adobe Premiere. I, I know that Premiere is kind of uh, deep and wide. Is there any other recommendation you might have for, like you did for your, your processing and imaging, any beginning editing software for video that people might consider? Oh, I wish I wish I had a good one. I know that there's plenty of, of free decent ones, or even if there's one that you find for $50 that takes the watermark off, getting that skill of, of editing and chopping up video and removing the bad parts and adding um, music if, if that's what you're going for. Um, yeah, I don't know any specific ones, but I know there are plenty of, you know, less intense tools than Premiere available. There's been a lot of innovation in uh, cameras and astrophotography in general, like CMOS cameras, mini computers, harmonic mounts. I imagine as you've, you've done your video, you've encountered those. And what are your thoughts about all those innovations? So, I mean, so it, it's great for, for content and interest in the hobby because it, it's always, I mean, this crowd, the astrophotography group is, is so into the gear that when something new comes, especially when it's a new type of technology, there's a lot of buzz, there's a lot of talk. Um, so that's great for, for engagement. Uh, but as I alluded to in the presentation, it's going against the grain uh, for me because I'm a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of guy. So uh, I would rather just keep using what's working, but I force myself to experiment with these new tools uh, to show others how to work it. Uh, it's, you know, the, the video that's hopefully coming out tomorrow really is a testament to how far we've come where, uh, yeah, the harmonic drive mounts and using a smartphone to control my entire imaging plan, the ASI Air and the mini computers, it's come so far. And I think this innovation um, indicates of, of the explosive growth that this hobby has had uh, to, to fund these types of projects over the last five years specifically. Um, and I know a lot of you in this, the Astro Imaging channel have seen uh, astrophotography come such a long way in terms of technology in the last 10 years. Yeah, some of us, uh, one in particular I'm thinking of, go all the way back, several people to film. We certainly come a long way since film. Uh, what's your favorite setup now when you go out and you make an image? What My favorite, favorite scope and camera <laughs> mount. My my favorite setup is the one that's that's actually running outside right now. Um, it, so it's a 75 millimeter refractor. This one happens to be a Radian branded refractor uh, on the AM5 um, strain wave or harmonic drive mount counterweightless uh, run on the ASI Air um, for, for the entire uh, session. And the camera is uh, a ZWO ASI 2600 MM Pro model. Um, with the filter wheel and chroma, nice chroma filters in there, the three nanometer um, narrow band and then LRGB. That's my favorite setup right now because I can lift the whole thing attached outside in the garage, run a really sophisticated imaging session on my phone, monitoring it on the couch in here, and then bring it back inside. And, and what about the capture software? What are you using? Capture soft. So it, the ASI Air I've, I've been using for almost everything now. Um, historically, I used Astro Photography Tool. Um, even though there were there were plenty of other great options available, I know that sequence sequence generator Pro I used a little bit. Nina I never uh, explored, although I still want to. But um, now it's a lot of uh, running almost everything exclusively through the ASI, ASI Air um, system. Now, you mentioned the, your transition between Photoshop and PixInsight. So where do you stand right now on that? So I, I, you know, eventually I think I would like it to be 50-50. I know that Photoshop will always be at least half of the process because I just feel like I, I have so much control there. Uh, and there's things that I, I think it actually does better. Um, but, you know, for way too long, I was holding off on the incredibly powerful tools of PixInsight that um, where it just automates something that that was you really couldn't do it a great way in Photoshop, um, and uh, it's really the more I can introduce PixInsight into my workflow, the better. Uh, but at this point, it's probably 30-70 with the 70% Photoshop. But but I'll get there. So there's more specific question about what are your thoughts about RC telescopes? 
Oh, I've only used one, Richie Creech, and uh, a great value. I mean, to get that kind of aperture uh, is great. I think they're, it's a practical choice. You know, starting at F10 makes things difficult, especially if you're jumping from an F factor uh, and all of a sudden you, you can't, you know, find out where you're located, you're having trouble focusing. Um, and then because it is a bit of a bulkier scope, and this, this happens if you switch to an SCT as well, um, you know, for, for, because I feel like the, the path of the amateur usually hopefully starts with a compact refractor. It is quite a jump to an RC. Uh, because you see that focal length um, and you say, wow, okay, for, you know, for, for around the same price, I can get to, you know, more like 1500, 2000 millimeters. Um, quite a big shift I found in terms of user experience. Um, so a bit of a hurdle there. Uh, you know, I've been looking at my notes. With, I think there's some other questions that came yeah. up. Wow. Can I, um, yeah, go ahead. Can, I, can I ask a couple? Um, OG shot glass asked earlier on, did you have photo experience before you got into uh, astrophotography? No, I, so I started astrophotography in 2010, uh, which was me putting my point and shoot camera up to the eyepiece of my daub. And because of astrophotography, I bought my first DSLR camera on Boxing Day uh, on a deal because I've said, you know, this, the, the experts are using DSLRs. So it was a little Canon Rebel. Uh, mm -hmm. DSLR and, and learning how to attach that to the telescope was my first experience using a DSLR. Okay, George's question uh, has been asked about what software you use. Simon asked a two-part question, and I think part of it's uh, been answered already. Um, uh, oh, actually, it hasn't. Well, what? Yeah, yes. Yeah. What scope has he been using most? And you told us that right now. And the other question he asked is. Um, what is next on your equipment list? What are you looking for next? The big thing, <laughs> it's literally big, uh, is getting my observatory moved over to our new house. Um, so <laughs> it was kind of cruel the way it went down. I finally decided to, to pour concrete, put a pier in and get a sky shed pod observatory uh, at our last house. And I got it running perfect. It was amazing. I had it through the winter, my cozy little space. Uh, and then we decided to move. And uh, right now the whole thing is in storage um, and, and just waiting to be rebuilt here. So that's on my mind to, to get that up and running. So, um, you know, in terms of gear, there's, there's a lot of, uh, nothing comes to mind other than that. That's kind of what's weighing on my shoulders right now, getting the observatory back up and running and, and maybe deciding on which gear is going to permanently live in there is a big decision. Okay, hey, um, I, I've got to talk to all the people out there that are making comments and asking questions. Um, Trevor's presenting tonight on how he learned how to be an as a backyard astronomer or astrophotographer and the growth of his website, stuff like that. You've asked a lot of questions about how to do specific things. And I don't mind if we continue it for a while, if you want to sit there and, and let's do it. Some of these questions could better be answered in, in another forum. And we've actually, some of the other people making comments have tried to answer some of your questions. But a question like, uh, who is it, John asked, um, what's the best way to get started in astroimaging? Whoa, that's like <laughs> two, three hours for of shows. There is a very big database of, um, of, of uh, programs on the astroimaging channel and uh, there are what eight years at, at 50 weeks per year or something like that so there's 400 shows out there and uh let me let me just if you, if you take a break uh travis or uh, uh, trevor i'm gonna uh, show them something here um if you have questions like that you can go to our website um here's the calendar of what's coming up in the future but uh, we have a program database, and that program database, it's got a spreadsheet in it. And this spreadsheet has all of our programs listed. And uh, Tom Fields was here a couple of weeks ago, and he told us about spectroscopy. And here's what happened in that show. And you can go all the way through this, and there are just, like I said, hundreds of shows. And if you want to find something about, um, Oh, geez, I hope I find something good here. 
Beginner. Well, there's a hit on beginner, and there's going to be another one. It just goes, there's 22 different mentions of the word beginner in our database. Uh, you can find all those programs back there. Um, if we've got more time, maybe we will ask some of those questions. But my point is that uh, those are big questions you're asking. It's not the kind of thing you could just, just, just ask and Trevor could just come up with the answer real quick like that for us. At any rate, uh, back to the meeting and... Um, well, why don't we ask Trevor, you know, questions about his experience and what comes in the future. Like, you're in a new location, how are the skies? You know what, I, I wish, I wish they were better than they are. I mean, don't we all, right? So, they're darker than I was. I, I've, we've moved three times now and we're still in the same city of about 150,000 people just to give you an idea of, of you know, how bad the light dome is in the city, the city center. Uh, now we're the farthest removed from downtown as we've ever been. So big glow towards the city and then probably a borehole five on a good night towards the west. So, um, you know, better than ever, but still not great. Have you ever thought about uh, locating in a remote observatory to get some darker skies? See, I have a weird thing with, um, you know, remote imaging. Um, if, I, because I, I feel like I, I want to be the one that, I feel like I haven't captured the image myself if I haven't set up the gear and it's not all my own gear. It's, it's, I know it's, it's not very practical, but it's just the way I am. Um, so in terms of a remote observatory, if I bought a piece of land and actually built an observatory, put all my gear there uh, at a dark sky site, that I could see happening. Um, but as far as, as just renting time uh, from a really dark sky place, it's just something that doesn't interest me at all. Mm -hmm. Hey, so uh, Trevor, we did have a question from someone you might know, Visible Dark is, yes. is asking, what was the turning point in your YouTube channel that really had it take off? And what what uh, could you relate to its huge growth? And then he throws in some fun stuff about Rudy and your charming personality, but we'll leave that out. <laughs> well, <laughs> Sean knows a thing or two about growing a YouTube channel. His his has been growing great and uh, same sort of thing where it's just, you know, what's worked for him is sharing his absolute most useful practical information with everyone about what he knows best, which happens to be PixInsight. Uh, for me, it was a bit different. Thank God it wasn't, uh, you know, if it was sharing PixInsight knowledge, no one would have subscribed for me. For me, I, I actually found that by sharing uh, the day-to-day -day real life kind of what it was like to be an astrophotographer seemed to work really well. Um, like I was saying with those algorithms, you never know when a video is really going to take off or why. Uh, but the first one that comes to mind that really took off was um, a video about me going camping and taking a photo of the Andromeda galaxy. And I shared a really personal part of my life that was, I mean, it felt like a, a bad idea at the time, but I was like, whatever, I'm just going to do it. Uh, and then the video just took off and all of a sudden I had all these people that were asking me personal questions. It was about my dad. And I was like, oh my God, these, these strangers know me and know this part of my life that I was scared to share. Maybe it's okay to share more of that. And, and that's why they'll appreciate that, hey, this is a regular person as opposed to someone that, you know, I'm going to go there, grab the information I leave, and then that's it. Where I think I got more subscribers because people are like, you know what, I, I like I, I like Trevor and I want to learn the way he teaches it. So that, I feel like that was the secret for me that worked. Not so secret. <laughs> Terrific, thank you. We're getting more questions here. Simon um, uh, commented that he really likes your Dylan O'Donnell collaborations. Have you ever um, met Dylan? I did. Yes, I, yes, I, I met him in person once in, uh, in New York at Neef. Uh, that was really cool because it was quite quite a uh, uh, trip for him coming from Australia to New York, much less so for me here in, in Niagara. Um, yeah, and those collaborations are one of the funnest parts about being a YouTuber uh, is because everyone, the, the audience gets excited to see it. It's fun to finally talk in person to someone that you've watched and admired uh, through a screen for so long. So I've done a few collaborations now and, and I want to do many, many more. Astro Mike wanted to know um, what just inspired you to become a YouTuber, make YouTube videos. 
Uh, because I am so self-taught, uh, as I was saying in the presentation, not a lot of formal education. I learn a lot more by browsing and being resourceful myself. Um, and, you know, like Alex just showed the, the archive of information on, on this channel. Um, that's the way I learn. So I said, you know what, let me make a video for the people that learn the way I like to learn. Uh, and, and that was, and then I just, you know, it was like an experiment that just kind of worked. And I was like, Hey, maybe it'll keep going. And, oh, wow. There's all these other parts of it that I, that I enjoy doing. And then, uh, at the end of the day, having a lot of people that actually watch something that has taken you a long time to create and, and tell you, oh, you know, like that was great. You really helped me. It's a great addictive feeling. So it kind of snowballs from there. Okay. Um, Delta Asset Photography. I think I'm finally catching up with you guys. Uh, Delta, how did you get past uh, beginners wanting to use the same old gear over and over? <laughs> it seems like a really tough thing to get past you as a you as a new YouTuber. It really that's that's one of the most difficult things. Uh, some people are doing such a great job of it. Um, Nico Carver. I'll try not to forget the question halfway through this time. Nico Carver has a great chance. He's an amazing astrophotographer himself who uses advanced gear, but he'll make a video of taking the Andromeda galaxy on a tripod with three second exposures, stacking a thousand three second. Like you have to pull yourself out of what do I want to be working out on as I progress my skills to what, what would reach a, a lot of people that don't know what they're looking at when they saw an equatorial tracking mount but they have this camera lying around. So it's it's the inverted pyramid, I like to think. To, to reach more people, you have to get broad. You have to assume that they know almost nothing about this world that, that we know all about. Once you get so specific talking about the latest AM5 mount, they're, they're so lost, they have no idea. So the key to, to, to growing your channel, I would say, and I've seen you out there, Delta, um, would be try doing some of that really broad stuff and experimenting with just kind of fun ideas um, and look to to what Nico's done to actually to blow up, and I think you'll find that uh, there's more to sharing um, about astrophotography than what you're currently working on. That was that's something I struggle with myself. We've got a couple of invitations for you. One from Greg Meyer asking any any chance you might visit the Southwest for some uh, imaging, and one from oh, who was it? Astronomy uh, Eric Astronomy. I, it scrolled off um asking if you've got any trips planned to the southern hemisphere oh yeah i mean nothing nothing set in stone yet but i mean it's 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 on the agenda um you know in my head for sure uh i i kind of love the fact that i've never been to uh the so i've never never ever seen the southern hemisphere sky uh, i kind of love that i'm hanging on to that is that one last not one last but that exciting experience that's still there um, so yeah, I, I, I have a feeling that next year will be the year that it, that it finally happens, whether it's Australia or Chile or one of those amazing Southern Hemisphere uh, destinations. Yeah, I've got to I've got to I've gotta get four more uh, Caldwell objects in the Deep South, and I wow. just can't wait to get back there. So, um, will you be other? Are you into imaging eclipses and stuff? Solar, no, it's like the uh, one of the few sides of, of astrophotography I have not explored other than the the mylar film uh, covering to watch, um, you know, mm -hmm. seeing sunspots or it was the um, Venus transit in, in 2012 that got me a little bit into it. But um, lunar eclipse is absolutely a, a great, uh, you know, beginner uh, topic in terms of, you know, reaching more people when there's a celestial event like that, like the one coming up on November 8th. Uh, if you can share that, that's kind of something that the, the, the masses know about. Um, so yeah, very much into lunar eclipses, less so solar uh, in terms of imaging, but you know, to to observe one, uh, you know, of course, an amazing. It's, yeah, it's certainly worthwhile knowing that. Well, actually, tomorrow night we probably should all get set up if we want to photograph mm -hmm. the the lunar eclipse. Is it is it got totality where you are? Kind it, of it'll be the low in the west, six a.m is when it's at totality and I'll have to get out of the backyard to somewhere with a low view and I will stand up on the roof with your yeah. tripod. It's supposed to be clear though, which is unheard of in November here. So I'll take it. 
before I ask DSO Imager's question, um, I, it seems like we've got a different audience than we often have. And you're welcome. Welcome, everybody, particularly if you haven't been here before. Um, you know, welcome. We do this every Sunday night. Um, have lots of different imagers, lots of different stuff going on. Um, but uh, if you have your own uh, astro imaging channel of some kind or another and want to be on, all you got to do is contact us on the contact sheet and say, hey, I'd like to do a presentation about so and so and such and such. Generally, if you look at all competent, you can get on here. I mean, you don't all have to be Trevor's, you know. Yeah. Anyway, but DSO Imager's questions was, there are many new astrophotography channels there now. Do you have the time to sometimes check out newbie channels? I, so I see them popping up like crazy just in my feed. Uh, I, I, I feel like I, there was a time when I used to know, okay, the, the dozen other ones that were out there. And now I see a new one every day. Uh, which I am so proud of because I I know that a lot of them, uh, in, I kind of inspired them to get going. Not all of them, of course, but if, even if a few of them are, which means that you know I did my job of, of of the inspiration, and maybe maybe new ones will be popping up after they see this talk. So I I, I try to check out new ones when I can. There was one uh, recently that was so well done. Um, I can't remember her name now, but. Uh, yeah, so I, I, not only do I try to, to watch, but I'll try to comment and uh, yeah, support those channels as well. That's one of my favorite things to do. Okay, we have left a lot of questions uh, unanswered. You know, how do you take pictures of the eclipse? What's the best uh, uh, imaging uh, tube to you know to start with? What you know, what is the beginning? How do I do this? How do I do that? Um, We'd love to be able to answer those things, guys. We really would. Uh, we kind of focused on the questions that we did send on to Trevor uh, on the questions about, um, you know, about becoming the, the YouTube star that, well, no, about becoming the backyard as, uh, astro imager that he's become. So um, we're sorry if we didn't get everybody. We, we you know, like I said, we try to do this every week and we have a lot more questions tonight than usual. Um, is there anything else we need to say tonight? By the way, you got a ton of people here saying, yeah, you were quite an inspiration. Uh, since we have a lot of new people here, make sure if you haven't been here before, hit the subscribe button. Yeah, yeah. And we see that somebody, who was it out there that uh, kicked in some dough? That was very oh, nice. Well, yeah. Not at all part of the requirements, but uh, there it is. Um, I actually found a tell us, great job as always, Trevor. And uh, Sean kicked in some dough. So thanks, Sean. Um, but again, we don't do it for the money. We do it because we like astro imaging a lot. <laughs> anyway. Have day job. <laughs> well, some of us are retired. <laughs> anyway, um, is there anything more we need? No, I think it's about Gary. time to say good night. Yeah, Gary, don't forget you're out next week and you guys, I think there's a link someplace back in there that uh, Molly put in how you can find them on uh, AstroBin. You can find the information about the compendium. So study up so you're ready to answer questions next week. Uh, and so glad to have you all here tonight. Thank you very much. Molly, you're in charge, right? Take us yep. out. All right. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody Trevor. For and uh, hope Thanks. to see you next week. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Trevor, stay with me.